because it's actually a stripped down upright piano, so I've taken away all the keys and the mechanism, um, sort of cleaned it up and hung it up, so it's just the soundboard and the strings. Um, and then on that, I've placed a series of uh, mechanisms, little motors and solenoids. And then the film I shot, it's just a complete unedited film of House Martins landing and taking off telegraph lines. And because it looks so much like a musical score, I wanted to find a way of that playing the piano. And this kind of links into to my love of graphic scores and also kind of indeterminacy. So I allow the birds to, um, they just move wherever they're moving or flying where they're flying. And then that's, that triggers the motors and the devices on the piano. Um, it's easy if I just show you a video to, to demonstrate how that works. <laughs> instruments for different, different sort of uh, 
uh, ways of selling them. Um, I've also been recently showing it outdoors, which has really excited me because <coughs> setting it in the woods amongst trees gives it another kind of like dimension for people to come across. And it's been shown in various light and sound walks. Um, so yeah, that's that's drawing on something that might come to you later to do with sort of placing works in public spaces and site specificness. But just moving back to the idea of this making a visual instrument or merging visuals and sound. With this um, piano, I've also experimented with using it in live performance as an instrument, a piano that's played by video. Keeping it with birds, because I like the idea of, of uh, using my racing birds and it fits this whole kind of sound world that I was explaining earlier. Um, I've got lots of films of birds and I've kind of edited them together and put them into different uh, short clips so that I can mix the video live. I can change the speed of the video live and the sensitivity of the translation of the video into mechanical movements. So, for instance, I'll just, I'll just turn it down a bit. So, um, shall we get on a little bit? And then I'm basically working with another performer called Matthew Alden, and he's sampling it live and kind of creating it different textures, We're also using some field recordings and other instruments that are made out of broken pianos. So it's kind of augmented in a sense more than just the piano being played by birds. So this crane flying, just an example, gives a really different kind of rendition of how the piano is played. So it becomes, it becomes a repetitive, rhythmic kind of, completely based on obviously phys physically where the, vis visually where the wings are going and which devices they're being placed.
there's actually, I go to this slide, it shows there's actually six of these, each with a pair of gas tubes. Um, and then each pair of gas tubes are interconnected by a kind of flexible silicon tube, and they share a body of water. And at the top of each stand, there's a mechanical arm that moves very slowly. And as that arm moves, the water goes from the higher one into the lower one, just using gravity. And then as they're at the same level, they would have the same amount of water in each one. And the way that I'm making sound is actually through audio feedback. So I have a microphone inside, just at the top, if you see it. There's a, there's a little microphone here and an LED light. Um, and then at the bottom of each stand, there's a speaker. It's a bit blurry there, but there's a speaker. So what's happening there is I'm just gradually, I'm using, again, Max MSP, um, to balance the feedback on the brink of making sound but not going crazy. So again, I was interested in this idea of tipping point, tipping point of audio feedback. So I'm controlling the gain of every microphone um, that's actually creating feedback tones. And then by moving the water levels, the water level will tune the feedback to a different note based on the resonant frequency of the mass tube. So it's basically kind of working like organ pipes work but using the water to change the height, the, the size of the tube. So I'll show you a video of that and you, and you can hear how it sounds.
the, using the resonant frequency inside the glass tube was when I was experimenting in the lab with the glass vessels, um, I don't know if you've ever tried this, but I was putting a really sensitive mic into a glass vessel with water and changing the depth of the water. And of course, what's happening is it's, you get this really, really filtered sound of the rest of the room, but it kind of really quickly sort of uh, finds a tone or kind of it has a, the resonant frequency of that space is quite enclosed. Um, becomes quite easy to pick out. Um, so it's kind of interesting if you're doing recording stuff, if you put your microphone in a tube, you will sort of start to hear the resonance of that tube because it's so enclosed. And of course, every space that we're in has got a resonant frequency. I don't know if you're familiar with Avon Lucy's piece, I'm sitting in a room where he repeats the description of the piece within the room and records it again and records it again, the same recording, until it becomes really a sort of acoustic description of the space. So those were the sorts of things that um, I, I knew about and was experimenting with and so that's how it kind of came about. But also very much made this piece for experimentation and practical, you know, playing with stuff. Um, another thing to, about that piece is the way that um, the way that I run the installation is that um, I don't have all the tubes on all the time and all moving all the time because you get very different textures if you have all of them on and all moving because they're all shifting and you get this really intermingled kind of almost choral texture. Whereas if you've just got two moving, you get these two rising and falling scales. Or if you have three on that are still and you've just frozen them at a particular point, then they might all be different notes or they might be the same. So what I, what I do is I set in a, a build-in a list of parameters and probabilities, so it's kind of how many are on, I don't say which one, so it might be six out of the twelve are on, and then I, I tell it how, how um, likely is it that a motor will be on within those pairs that are on, um, and so then what happens is it never repeats, so I sort of make this list of parameters that it will wo work through at random um, orders. Because um, I'm quite interested in how it can kind of create a sequence within an installation that feels organic, that doesn't feel fixed, that doesn't loop. So always thinking about and working with. So with the piano, it was kind of allowing where the birds fly to create a sequence. And with this one, it's giving it a lot of parameters that, but because there's probabilities within there, it's never going to repeat. Um, so it kind of has an organic quality. But I do know that it's not going to be all on at the same time. There is going to be a shift in densities over a period of time and I think that's what I was after. I wanted people to come into the installation and not and experience some moments where there's some on that are all still all on or moving and the probability of that happening is quite high. So in a sense that's how I wanted to control it to, to maintain this element of um, open score or generative quality for the composition. Um, just the lights actually respond to the sound. So again, this is how I was kind of trying to connect the visual and the sonic quite directly. Um, so I'll go back to the picture. I think most of the photos, they've all got their lights on because it worked for the photo, but um, the, the lights only come on when the, they're, they're basically sound responsive. So the volume of the um, feedback will determine the brightness of the light. So when you get two tones very close together and you get this kind of pulsing, beating effect of them interfering each other, then the light will also be kind of emphasising that. Um, and what works really well in this piece is that it draws attention to which tubes are resonating, because with that kind of sound world, it's not always easy to know what direction it's coming from. So it kind of um, helps make a bit more explicit what's happening in the installation. And also, um, creates this kind of shifting light level which affects the kind of immersive quality of the installation and also the kind of pulsing light uh, connected to the um, connected to the, the lambs of the feedback. Um, so with this piece it works as an installation but I also do a live performance with it where I can actually control all those elements live, which ones are on, how much they're moving. Um, what the microphone gain is. And then I also put that through a series of guitar pedals and just play with the sound and the acoustics of the space with, with um, you know, four more speakers. And so what's interesting about that is 
I've taken away that element of indeterminacy in the composition, but because of the nature of this installation and because it uses feedback, um, there is still this element of dialogue where even if I control it with my controls, I can't be completely in control of um, everything at my fingertips. So it, it's almost like a dialogue with how the estate is responding to what I'm doing. It's not, I mean, I, I know roughly what it's going to do, but it's, it's not got an element of precision, and I find that quite interesting. It's a bit like the piano as well. When I put different videos on, it will respond, and then I'll sort of tweak it and change it and work with how it's responding. So this is um, an extract from the performance.
projection. It's actually it's quite difficult to photograph. Actually, this this shows a bit better. So it's a kind of uh, wooden plinth with a big circle that's back projected into, and then you can draw onto that with a with a pen that uses infrared sensing. And as you draw, you can um, hear the recordings from those locations in Glasgow. And also the selections at the bottom where you can choose different, um, like you choose pH or um, phosphorus content or various other different, or the metallic content, that various different versions of the results of the scientific testing. And, that, and, and with that, I slightly filtered and changed the sounds and the colours of how the um, projection kind of works. So this, this project did culminate in this audio-visual installation where I've kind of mixed this um, interface, this kind of audio-visual interface where you can kind of draw and make your own underwater composition or exploration of the city. And people do find it really fascinating about, you know, what, what different parts sound like underwater. It's quite abstract because a lot of underwater recordings vary on for so many uh, reasons to do with whether the water flow or whether there's life in there. But we got some amazing recordings of um, some invertebrates and insects and water boatmen up in one of the locations. I don't know if any of you is a hydrophone recording, but um, you can get amazing results. And it can also be really disappointing because you hear nothing. But it's, it's a really fascinating process to go through, especially with other people. And especially walking around the city, finding good locations to make recordings um, in research for the workshops. Um, as soon as you kind of do something like that, everybody wants to know what you're up to. So I spent a lot of time giving my headphones to dog walkers and all kinds of different people. And it was actually a really fascinating process. And I had this idea that I could just go out and do recording and have like, you know, four sets of headphones with me and just do recordings and give them out to whoever passed. And um, I do have quite a passion for bringing artwork into public space and engaging with people who might not necessarily go to an experimental music gig or to a gallery or to that kind of festival. So that, that was really inspiring as part of this project. Um, I did get to show the installation in a really fantastic location in Glasgow um, at the Lighthouse, which is the Centre for Architecture and Design, and they've got this fantastic water tower designed by Manny Macintosh. Um, it's a difficult to see in this picture, but basically it's a water tower with, with this had a spiral staircase built into it, so you can walk up and see amazing views. So I managed to show the piece in there, so I, had, I designed the installation as a circle so that it would be at the bottom of the spiral staircase uh, with all these underwater recordings of the city. So that was kind of um, a really nice context to, to kind of show that. Um, yeah, so that's submerged, kind of something connects to tipping point. Um, has anyone got any questions? What should uh, the tipping point, what, yeah, the, I was just curious, like, because it's to do with balance, mm. when, when, when they reach the balance, mm. would it not stop? Actually, they just change direction. Oh, you mean the sound stop? Or? Well, yeah, well, once the water, like, between the two tubes, because they're sort of connected, yeah. just in my head, I just thought that would then be the it, equilibrium and it would just stop. Well, actually, what it does is it makes the same note. So they just become in unison with each other. So as they shift, one gets lower in tone and one gets higher in pitch. Sorry. And um, as they get to be level, they create the same pitch. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they... Does that mean that, that then those two tubes are, they're not going to then move? Um, well, I mean, all of that's controlled purely by <coughs> this system that I've set in place. So the, the arm moves really slowly and it has got a limit point so that it doesn't right. go too far. And then, the starting and stopping, when it's an installation, I'm controlling just by a series of um, indeterminate sort of periods of time. So there's an element of um, control, but I'm not fixing it. So it might it might be there when it stops, or it might be there when it stops, or it might just continue moving while all the rest of them stop. So the installation works where you might by chance have them both at the same, or it might be that they continue moving because it moves really slowly. There's a point where they're level and you hear the same note and then they sort of continue and then they fall into different pitches again. But when I play it live, I do play a lot with that where I even them all out and they become the same note and then move one. And it, and it becomes actually quite a nice way of showing the process of how it's working. 
just a question about piano migration. Um, we're using the projectors to project the images yeah. of the piano. Oh, okay. And then the, all the motors and everything, were they controlled by, or were they controlled by? They're actually controlled by the top of the Max MSP, which you can use to oh, build. Yeah, the, yeah. Sorry, the hole oh. between Max and MSP. Oh, yeah, right. Just... I basically just used um, a minimum voltage board, which, um, if you're interested, I can give you a link to it. There's various different places you can get those from. So basically, I'm just analysing the video, turning it into MIDI information, and sending that into this box, which means I can use up to 12 volts uh, yeah. and wire that to every motor individually. Oh, cool. Right. Things exist like that. So <laughs> it's just, I mean, you can do stuff with Arduino as well, but then you need a motor driver, and there's all sorts of different ways of working with that. But um, yeah, there's various different okay, cool. versions of that. So yeah, mini to voltage. Okay. Any other? I've got a few more pieces to show you if I can carry on as well. Yeah, can I just follow up? Uh, the, I thought when when you showed the slide of the piano, yeah. I couldn't see the room. I would be interested mm. in, in the space. Uh, so you don't have a camera that's looking at your installation and seeing the birds on the piano, no? No. Where, it's, where is the movement <laughs> analyzed? So it's, it's analyzed, so because I'm using a, a video that I've already recorded, I'm analyzing it Inside. On, the, on the computer just <laughs> before I project it. Ah. Because, um, I mean, I started off, that piece grew from wanting to make an audiovisual way of playing the piano. And I started off with light sensors so that you could play it with light. And with, then I started using projection to be really precise about that mm. and the brightness and stuff. But with that video of the birds, it's not about light and dark, it's about movement. Um, I didn't want it to be about light. Like, even though they're shadows, I wanted it to be when a bird's still, it doesn't make sense, only when it moves. So I switched the process to basically whatever video I'm projecting is from a computer and then I just analyse it as it's being projected. I don't need to look at it with a camera as well. You see what I mean? It's the same thing. Yes, I do. I, I guess I'm just uh, interested in, in how as an audience I would understand what you're doing. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I remember many years ago I tried to do this with a fish in a, in a oh, right. outside with a, with a little uh, fish aquarium, but I had a camera there, so mm. the audience would see I'm looking at the movement of the mm. fish. But you think the audience intuits that? Yeah, I mean, I think it in maybe the, the, the sonic aspect. I think the thing is because I've lined up the video with the actual physical device. When you look at it closely, you see a bird flutter, and you and also you see hear. you see the motor directly next to it playing the acoustics of the strings. So, if the sound were, for instance, just purely electronic on speakers, I don't think it would be explicit at all. But because it's a physical movement, okay. um, I just pop back to it. Okay. Then people make the connection. But it's when people come close and look. They go, oh, hang on, gone too far. So. So you get a real sense of um, feeling about birds and others fluttering the device kind of physically moves. So I think actually the video is not so explicit as it is in the video and the video of the, you know, um, show, it's called For the Birds 
and it's with a group of other artists and we're sort of touring it. Um, it's got about 30 different installations and a light and sound walk and it's part of that. But um, So we sort of bring everything in at night and put it out again. But it is quite challenging putting stuff in front of space. Do you have any real birds flying into it? Um, I've not seen any. <laughs> it's always a risk. <laughs> Um, yeah. I don't know how they respond. I, I will tell you that dogs really like it. <laughs> I've had really good responses, especially from Jack Russell's, but I don't ask you why. Um, so, just, I'll just show you a few more pieces as well, um, moving into some more collaborative work that I've made. Um, so, this is a piece called Pantsess that I made with a Swedish artist called Daniel Skobin. Um, and we were both kind of working a little bit with. Um, I think I was, just before I made the piano, I was kind of working with these rolling sequences over videos, creating sounds based on visual information. And Daniel was making these graphite sequences where he was using pencil as, uh, graphite pencils as conductive material to do drawings. So this piece has sort of come very much out of Daniel's graphic, uh, graphite sequences. So, as I'll come back to this picture, and I'll show you a video as well, but basically, the setup of the performance is that we are, we put a big piece of paper on the floor, about three metres by two metres, and we perform within that space. We also line up a projector on the ceiling with the paper, and there's also, uh, and then we work with these machines that Daniel's made, these kind of, there's four of these sequences, which are these four-legged machines, which are really wonderful. Um, and what they do is um, they've got a rotating arm, and they've also got a tail. So they're basically, again, they're working with audio feedback. So what we're doing is we're using the graphite of the pencil to complete a circuit to then connect um, an internal feedback loop within a mixing desk. So we're triggering bursts of feedback. So basically, the, the machine has got a tail, which is one end of the um, one, one point of the circuit, and then it's got a rotating arm, which is the other point of the circuit. Now if you draw a pencil line between where the tail is and where the arm goes over, you will connect the circuit and create the feedback. So it's kind of like there's a break within the wiring of this feedback and what we're doing is we're using pencil to kind of reconnect that break. You might have seen other things like draw audio and various other kind of ways of drawing the circuits using graphite or conductive paint or conductive paint anyway. Um, so that's how it's working technically. So we basically draw on the floor with graphite pencils and then we move these sequences around and they create these feedback connections. And um, there's a way of uh, changing the direction of the arm, the speed of the arm, and also deciding whether or not all four of them are in sync with each other and work with relative sort of quarters or thirds of speed rotating with, with each other, or they're just completely free um, and we just change the speed manually. Um, so we work with these machines to create the sound, and then the projection is actually triggered by the sound. So to start with, we were really interested in this idea of audio-visual feedback. So to start with the drawing, we start with a projection of a drawing of us. So we draw around that. And then we start to use the machines to kind of sonify the drawing of ourselves. Um, and then they, those sounds and pulses trigger digital drawings that are projected onto the paper, which we can choose to then follow with the pencil and then they would make sound. So we sort of start the performance with a really explicit way of showing that and demonstrating that. Um, and then as we go through the performance, we kind of, it becomes much more of an improvisation where we kind of then start working with video textures and just sort of working very much more with, it's, it's very much, again, it's a dialogue with, the, with what you've already done. So you might start making marks and the heavier the pencil, the uh, stronger the connection, more voltage will flow, and it changes the pitch of the feedback. So there's lots of different parameters that change the sound. Um, so as you're working with it, you can then shape it, you can listen and then shape what you've got and put marks in where you can see the arms passing. 
it'll become clear I'm going to show you the video. And we've also got um, infrared sensing on each um, machine. So there's an infrared camera where the projector is. And it, so it's possible to know where the machines are and line up some of the projection material with where they are. So uh, this is a short extract from bits from the performance. And there's some other sound stuff going on as well. And if you can see the arm going round, it goes over. Um, 
from like mobile phones. So I built an instrument that was kind of reconstituted out of a broken toy piano, but also uh, and it was to kind of create these shifting tremolos and clouds of sound that sonically are quite similar to the kind of these strange landscapes that Solvay was making. Um, and also the instrument, as I really enjoy, has got elements of um, chance involved. So these little motors, the way they bounce, it can vary. There's, no, there's not an absolute precision. You kind of um, have to keep tweaking it and working with it. So again, I'm quite interested in how you build things that can't be precisely controlled. So you have to have this really intense sort of dialogue with them and respond to how they're working. So um, it was, this was commissioned by the Goldfield Ensemble for a tour that they're currently doing with um, films and live music. So I, there was a string quartet also playing in that, so I also took the opportunity to include them. So this was really exciting for me because I've not really done much scored music, so I actually uh, scored a part for this instrument that I built, gave it to someone else to play, which I've never done before, and then also wrote for the string. So it's kind of challenging and interesting and kind of amazing to have a gig and then just sit down and watch someone else do it. It was really quite um, relaxing. Well, I don't know whether relaxing is the right word, but anyway, it was an interesting, it's a different process for me. And um, so this is really new. And, and Solvay's video is it's really beautiful. I don't know how well it's going to come across because it's a smaller, more compressed version, but she actually just won the German Drawing Prize for this video in its um, sort of projected, like, non-performed silent state, so it's really exciting that it's got that recognition. So I'm just going to um, show you a little bit of it. Oh, sound up. So it's really subtle, um, and again, with the strings and the instrument that I've built, I wanted to work with sounds on the edge of respite, expanding from silence. And with the sort of the sound, the, the sort of clouds of um, 
sound that that's, that's coming from the built in studio. I wanted to be able to stream quickly, but um, I wanted to work with a really kind of minimal amount of pitch material and just sort of change. There's a lot of changes and shifts in the style of playing in the timbre um, and sort of little rhythmic pulses, just really trying to sort of form a kind of sonic connection with how this elaborates, this drawing kind of elaborates on this one sort of single white line into this strange planet-like form that then kind of disappears again. So again, you know, uh, interesting to see how it how it works with um, the different kind of performances and different venues. So this is a photo of it in um, context of the place. Um, and then and this is the, the, the instrument. Um, so it's kind of yeah, it's like one piano bowed, and then these little. Uh, devices that hold the motors that can be put close to the. I've got two sets of these metal fines. And then the setup is that um, <coughs> it needs to be contact mics. Um, and then it, there's various sort of like scored parts to use reverb and pitch to create different functions. And this is Kate Romano playing it. Um, so, Running out of time for me, I'm not really sure I'm supposed to finish now because I can't remember when I started. <laughs> it was late, I know. I've got one more piece I want to show you, um, which is again this current piece that I'm showing in Scotland in various locations at the moment. Um, I haven't got documentation for the latest version of it, but basically it, it's again connected to wanting to sort of put work in public space, not take people by surprise in their everyday life. Um, so I've made lots of origami birds out of this waterproof paper called Tybet, they're about this big, and each bird has an LED house within it. And I put a string up hundreds of them down lanes and in various different locations so that I can then light them up in sequence. So that I position the wings at different like, heights so as they light up in sequence it looks like a bird flying overhead. And the idea is that it's the season of bird migration in Scotland at the moment, there's lots of geese coming down from Greenland, Iceland and the Arctic and settling in Scotland and it's kind of a celebration of that and also to kind of um, encourage me to look up and notice the birds but these, these sort of come on at dusk when all the birds have sort of roosted and gone to their sleeping places um, and as they, as they light up I've also sent sound uh, stationed along with the whole row of birds. I don't actually have documentation of that yet. So um, I originally did the piece without sound and I added sound for it in Scotland. It makes a massive difference, this sense of movement through space. And also they go on for like uh, 80 metres or so. So you really get a sensation of something moving overhead, whether you notice the light or look up or you actually get the sound as well. I've got a short video. Um, which And this was, this was actually in the Wye Valley um, at Tintin North Station, so it was a really great location to be able to like, place the strings of birds in between trees. So up in Scotland I've gone to three different locations in Dumfries, uh, on a tiny little lane next to a pub that's famous for Robert Burns and I live there. And then in Glasgow it's in a quite wide lane, uh, a wider lane and much higher up and there's like three different roads that cross over. And then in, in Dundee, it's actually in a sort of old cemetery that's 500 years old, it's deconsecrated, and it's again, they're, they're going between trees. So they're really different locations. So it's interesting to sort of uh, experience that, um, how people respond and people come across it by chance. So that's some really positive feedback so far. We've also had 50 mile an hour winds, which was a bit alarming. I had to go and tend to them after that. But uh, I think the whole thing was right. I haven't heard anything to the contrary. Anyway,
anyway, that's, that's what I've got to show you today. So I don't know if you've got any more questions or anything that you need to do through, through the talk, but if you've got any other questions, then I'll um, Just a like, quick te technical one about that last one. Just the, uh, the have you uh, do you have like small speakers all the way along? Like how many do you have? Quite a lot of them. To yeah, I'm really glad you asked that because it took a lot of. Uh, yeah. It's really simple the way it works now, but I really struggled with it because I didn't want to use using a sound card would just be so clunky because I wanted to send speakers you know, 100 meters and mm. I wanted to have loads of them. So I actually have one speaker every. 10 meters, and I've basically, well, the, the lighting is controlled by, by DMX from the computer, so I'm controlling, so you get like 500 channels, so I'm basically able to con individually control all the birds, um, but, so I'm in controlling the, the sound sort of locally, so I've made a box that's got um, an amp and a little MP3 board where you can, you can send a pulse to just trigger next track. So it's all self-contained, and then that's stereo, so I run that one of those boxes every 20 metres and have it panning. So it's kind of like, it was really crazy to edit it, because I had to make little mini micro-compositions that were like 8 seconds long, and then divide them up into 1.6 second chunks with fades. So they were, you know, you put that much in each speaker, and then it's all about getting it to sort of fade, so it feels like it's moving. Um, so yeah, it was just discrete, so using just really cheap components and just triggering it with voltage again, making the sound. So I got quite excited about that because the possibilities of having really loads and loads and loads of speakers and controlling when they trigger just using voltage is, is really neat. Yeah. So you don't have to have loads and loads of audio cables. Yeah. So if you want a link to that board, yes. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> I'll send you that well. Um, but yeah, so much of this kind of work involves ordering sort of loads of different various, like learning about that kind of stuff and finding out where you get it from. And do you solve it or do you do the electronics yeah, yourself? Yeah, I do all the electronics myself and I work with a programmer um, called Matthew Alden and he does all the maximum SP stuff. So between us we kind of do the different bits. Great. I just want to ask about dynamics. Is anything, any information that you receive from the videos or the processing tipping point controlling the volume? In which? All of, any, anything. Uh, just, or just a set volume that you've decided. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, it depends on the piece, I suppose. So you are, you are controlling dynamics? You are. Um, yeah, in some pieces, okay. yeah. I mean, so in Luminous Birds, I'm not controlling dynamics because it's kind of fixed, because I've, I've housed everything up high, and so I'm just triggering it. And the volume I've, I've set on volume controls, and then left up high. Hmm. So I can't, uh, that's decided. The um, palette says drawing on the floor piece, um, the strength of the volume is actually, does depend on how much graphite pencil you draw on the floor. So, and with the scored piece, then it's completely scored, so that has got dynamics. And the piano piece at the beginning? Piano piece, um, actually no, I'm not really controlling the, the actual dynamics of that, because it's all acoustic, but I'm basically, I control the strength of how fast the motor goes, how, um, how much voltage is put through the motor or the solenoid, and that's how hard it taps. Mm -hmm. But the setup I have at the moment, I'm just, it's just they're all set. So um, it's more like with that piece, what I can control is uh, so if you have a bird flapping in one place and it continues flapping, because the sound's percussive, I have to decide how often that repeats if the bird continues flapping. So I, I I change those parameters. Um, when it's installation, I have those parameters fixed at a point with the video that I'm happy with, but when I play it live, I could continually change those settings. So rather than changing the dynamics, I'm changing the kind of density or intensity of um, the movement. Well, actually, I can change the dynamics a little bit with that as well. So I change that live. Does that answer your question? And finally, tipping point. Sorry to oh, yeah. be thorough. Again, it's, it's that same question. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, when it runs an installation, um, I pretty much think... And how loud is it? It's, I, I set a kind of threshold of volume when I run it as an installation. So basically, when I trigger a tube to come on, I can set how long it takes to fade in or and what the gain is. So what I do is I sort of 
spend some time in the space with it because different spaces are going to be more resonant. And then I set a volume that I feel works for the most dense setting and the most sparse setting. But then yeah, when I play it live, I completely control all of that um, on Faders live. And is, is it ear splitting volume or very. No, when it's an installation, it's, it's quite. Yeah, it's getting that balance where it's um, immersive, but it's not ear splitting. But it's it's got enough going on so that you're it's it's you know it's loud enough to feel immersive. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And then with the live performance, the points where it does get quite loud, but not really loud. I'm just curious. Yeah, no, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I think it should make it louder. <laughs> <laughs> but the live performance, it, when it when it starts pitch shifting it and bringing in some distortion and sort of pitch, uh, reverb and that, you can get quite a nice big sound. And mm. Again, the piece is designed on sort of the way sound resonates within these small spaces, so I do want it to have a kind of resonant quality when it's, when it's live in a bigger space and feel like you're immersed in the sound. I really, I like going to performances where I can feel the physicality of the sound, mm. like really noisy stuff. I really, I do love that as well. I've, I've actually seen Tipping Point twice. Oh, have you? Yeah, I saw it at the Brown House. Oh, did you? And I saw it at King's Place. Oh, great. And this was... Was it at King's Place? I think so. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. And I think that the w how you played it here was louder than oh. both of those spaces. Really? Yeah. You mean... Maybe it's because I'm sitting behind the speakers and I'm not sure <laughs> how I'm doing it, but... Um, you mean the installation or the performance? <laughs> Sorry? Did you, what did you think of the volume in the actual installation? How did it work? I felt like it could have been louder, actually. Right, okay. <laughs> oh, right, good, right, okay, that's good to get some. But the, yeah. the difference in space has completely changed your piece. It was really interesting to see it twice. I yeah. wish I'd seen it again, actually, in, like, a, again, a different configuration. Yeah, the first time I showed it was in a really, really large space, but very low ceiling. It's kind of like a very concrete underground car park space. And in Norwich, of all places, where you wouldn't expect to in a space like that. But um, yeah, it's really, really resonant. And I think that's one of my favourite spaces mm -hmm. that I've shown it in. Are you saying it was very static? It was quite. I think it's. Yeah, I think I mean to say in the audience, uh, what did the people do when it was so static? Were they very attentive and quiet? But, yeah, but it was very slow. Like it's. Mm. In the video, it seems like it moves more, but actually, when you're in the space, it's incredibly subtle the movement. Mm. And people tend to fall quite still. Ah, that's interesting. And the moment someone starts to speak, they realise that they've spoken and they're kind of yeah. like, oh, I shouldn't have made sound. And there's this quite heavy... Well, I think it's just like when I'm in the space and showing it, I set a volume that I feel is, that works for that, that space. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's so subjective about, you know, how loud it is and how different people respond. But with that piece and with the piano, people go, do go really quiet. Um, so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's extremely provocative to think of the way you call installation an instrument. To think of what you're building as an instrument for audiences to explore playing. Yeah? For audiences to explore playing with the resonance or with the reverb, to see whether they can affect yeah, it or how they are affected by the instrument. I mean, the thing is, is people don't, it doesn't, their presence doesn't affect it. I mean, sometimes, I mean, I do get this thing where people go to the piano and wave their hands and sort of try and <laughs> do something. And then some people go, well, why don't you make it interactive? It's kind of, well, I don't, it's not, that's not really what the piece is about. But it, you do, sometimes people think it's important to interact on the first instance if they go towards one and it comes on. But um, I think generally it is. I've not had people kind of try and... Yes, and I, I, maybe I don't really mean that. I mean oh, you're sorry. Else. I, mean, I mean something else, and I don't know what yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> you refer to the Wi-Fi as having some form of conductivity. Yeah. I'm interested in the conductivity, whether the presence of people in such a room uh, changes or affects our hearing of the music. Um, well, actually, with Tipping Point, it does actually affect it because if you have, if it, I've noticed that when it gets really full, if people are 
I've had people come in and sort of all sit down in the middle, or I've had someone do yoga in there as well once. Um, but when, you, when there's lots of people sitting in the middle, then it does start to dampen the feedback process actually. So there are there are occasions when I don't have control over the volume and the sort of intensity of it because it changes based on bodies in the space. It does change it, yeah. I mean, it's subtle, but it does, it does change it. I mean, the thing with the volume is quite interesting because I've had, it, it's like sensitivities of those sort of feedback sounds and I've, I think there's a kind of threshold where it needs to not really be too loud because it's quite high and it can be a bit less, I don't know, it's about finding a balance where it's, it's subtle and um, but doesn't get ear splitting or kind of too, um, what's the word, ringy in your ears. You know. But about this interactivity, I actually found it, found it really, like I love the fact that it wasn't. Mm. That it was really like you walk into this space and there's this organism and you, you don't quite understand how each body, a sculptured body, like mm -hmm. relates to one another, but you kind of accept it as a whole. And you follow these tubes, and you follow the weights, and you—I don't. It's, it really affected me physically, like the oh, the right. slow. I, I don't know why I just started feeling them, like the two sides of a body, and like your lungs and everything. Oh, wow. just, but that was me. That was no, me. That's sorry. Really <laughs> um, but did you, when when you were experiencing that, did did you get a sense of of what was happening and how it was working, or did yeah. you not? You did. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it seemed quite. I mean, you show it. You show exactly how it functions. It's yeah. I, well, I kind of want it to be explicit what's going on, especially and with the piano and with most of the things. So you can, but then it not to be, but it to have more happenings that you want to stay and experience the different um, combinations of yeah. different things because it doesn't repeat. The fact that there is a number of them, mm -hmm. and the way that the light pulses and gives it almost life, it gives us this. Um, yeah, it just it. it you feel like you were something alive, not something okay. just a structure. That's what I mean by it, I think. Yeah. So because you feel like you were something else which is living, you stay among it? Yeah. And did you, did you think it worked in the two different spaces, the Round House and King's Place, which do you think worked? Round House. You did? Oh, okay. It was much more like a cocoon, the space. Yeah. You created this like black, yeah. rounded. There was like curtains, I think. Yeah. Like, so it, yeah, because it was just a completely open space, so we kind of totally yeah. blacked out. So it felt incredibly intimate, and it really yeah. felt like you were going inside this world. Yeah. In the in King's Place, I think the walls were white. You didn't put a yeah. backdrop, so you yeah. could see the room. You could. I know. I, yeah, I prefer it to be black, but um. And it changed. Yeah. It just changed yeah, the piece. Changed. I think because I had the first experience first, it was mm -hmm. hard for me to see it somewhere yeah. else, maybe. <laughs> I mean, it does always shift in these places. Yeah. Sorry, we're getting to work. That's all right. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, okay, final uh, questions. Okay. What I was going to ask, your, your commission when you apply for them, uh, your body, people that you've been working with, how do you find that? Like, how do you find your work? How do I find... Do you apply for the commissions, or does your work tour, or how do you get to collaborate with the people that you've just shown us? Like, it's kind they of like sort of, or you... It's a sort of knock-on effect, really. Okay. Um, so, I actually made the piano when I was doing my master's degree at Oxford Brooks, and then that triggered quite a lot of um, touring with that piece. Right. And from that, I got the commission for Tipping Point from showing that, and actually, the organisation Cryptic, who commissioned Tipping Point, are now one of their associate artists, so they actually help and organise touring and sort of broker relationships and things like that. But I mean, I think, it's sort of, touring work and going to different festivals, the, there's always like promoters and people at those festivals and stuff, and it's kind of, um... Have you been out of all your practice, like your work being transposed into different spaces? Sorry, start to say that again? How so has it transferred in your practice as an artist, your work moving around in different places? And like, you know, like you had the first idea of something being like a piano piece with your masters, go somewhere else, how does it differ? Or move on, or uh, you know, does it migrate back your the work that you've used to? I mean, I think I like touring work because I think it gives me a chance to see it in different ways and talk to different people about how they're experiencing it. Like, it's always really interesting. And 
to see how people respond. So that always kind of, it, it takes me quite a while to know how I feel about a piece actually, or, you know, get, it's, you know, it's not like I have tipping points set up all the time, you know, so it's quite, that one especially I built in the possibility of doing a live performance with it, and I change it every single time I do it, I kind of completely bring some different pedals, and, and I kind of, that's, that's what keeps that one challenging me and going in different directions. Um, Yeah, and then also putting luminous birds, that's really recent in public space. It's, I've asked a lot of questions about that and thinking about just the challenges of that, technically and physically, in terms of putting stuff and it being okay and not falling down or getting vandalised or, you know, destroying itself or not stopping working. I shouldn't say that because it's still on, I've got a few more weeks to go. But um, I think when you're really immersed in finishing something, it's like a kind of total cloud of deadline and doing it and then I think it's really good to get some perspective and it is good to show stuff you know more than once and continue to kind of live with it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and it's and it's still it's also really great to take things to certain festivals and see I mean it's like when you get to sort of see a lot of other work as well because it is quite often that I might be in an audiovisual festival or in a media arts festival or in something like that. So that most of the stuff I'm showing is at festivals. And so you're then immersed in like an exhibition where there's loads of other audiovisual installations that someone's curated and live performances. And, and I find that, you know, super inspiring to like see loads of other work and meet loads of other artists. And so that's kind of food in a way as well. So it's kind of important to talk and meet people and kind of have conversations. And yeah, definitely great opportunities for that sort of interaction. Okay. Uh, so unless anyone has a final burning question, um, I'd just like to thank you, Kathy, for sharing your...